LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is Nick Duffel, who joins us to discuss his book, Wounded Leaders, British Elitism and the Entitlement Illusion. In an age when America elected its first black president and the Middle East stirred with popular uprising, Britons were again content to elect the products of their elitist public schools. But their grooming for power aside, does such an education produce excellence or expertise in self-deception and duplicity? The early 21st century gives us some clues. Tony Blair maintained his facade of inner conviction but lost the nation through blind allegiance to the establishment. David Cameron let his boyish mask of caring sincerity slip to reveal a bully's attitude beneath his meritocratic pretense. A bicycle in Downing Street highlighted a deep-seated problem in Britain, a divided society caught in the enduring trance of the entitlement illusion. Duffel argues that the British national obsession with sending the children of the well-heeled away to school has a major impact on our society, our institutions and our attitudes. He proposes that a cherished national character ideal, issuing vulnerability and practising a normalised covert hostility based on bullying in the dorm, adversely affects even those who did not have such an education. This specific culture of elitism, protected by financial interests and the it-never-did-me-any-harm syndrome, means that Britain is unlikely to foster the kind of leadership necessary in our world of increasing complexity, which needs cooperative global solutions. And worse, new scientific evidence shows that this hyper-rational training leaves its devotees trapped within the confines of an inflexible mind and beset with functional defects. Through the lens of the British case, Duffel presents a perspective on the universal defects of untempered rationality and proposes a revised model of leadership more fit for the uncertain future our world faces. Hello and welcome Nick and thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Oh well Greg, uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me, it's a pleasure. Nick, today we're going to talk about your latest book which is entitled Wounded Leaders, uh, British elitism and the entitlement illusion. Before we get into that, um, tell listeners a little bit about your background, because this is particularly relevant to your personal background to the work that you've ended up doing. Yes, you're right. Um, well, uh, I had uh, ten years in in boarding school as a as a as a child, and then I was kind of found myself uh, at an Oxford college without having had made very much many many choices. Of my own choices, uh, I, I thought at that time, doing what uh, was sort of required of me, and it was, it was 1968, and the world was was changing uh, very fast around me, and yet I uh, was I was in an atmosphere which could have been recognised perhaps, you know, in in 1880 of the cloistered world of Oxford, and. Um, I found the whole public school in Oxford business rather, rather, uh, rather strange, and, and it wasn't teaching me what I wanted to know about life. I was enrolled to do politics, uh, psychology, and philosophy, and um, what I learned in my first couple of terms is that economics and the need for a constant um, uh, pool of unemployed didn't impress me, and, what, and I, philosophy. I thought I was going to be studying about life, but we, we had we, what we what we did was formal logic. So I changed my course, and uh, I had been interested in a sort of phenomena of uh, Orientalism, which had been hitting the world at that time. So I changed my course to read Oriental studies, and 
got myself through Oxford as a bit of a rebel, but with a longing to get to India. And so I got myself very easily a job in India just by writing to the Indian High Commission as a teacher in, believe it or not, another uh, a private boarding school. And it was there when I was at this place, not, you know, having had no training to teach, that I looked at this chaotic, amazing world of India and just wondered, you know, how the hell did the British Raj actually govern and run this place? Uh, and how did they not get completely overwhelmed? And how did actually and why did the Indians seem to still love us? Or, you know, whereas I was embarrassed about my colonial past. And so a bunch of questions started to form in my mind, which took me many, many years to answer. And then after India, I dropped out and I trained to be a carpenter and I did self-sufficiency until I had a breakdown in my mid-30s and then I retrained myself to be a psychotherapist. And after that retraining, I began to tackle some of the questions which I had been asking myself before. And mostly that was in the sort of fledgling men's movement in the, in the late 80s. Uh, and I recognized that there was a, a, spe a specific kind of guy, in fact, which I was, who had been through this kind of elite education. And actually, it, 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 instead of really equipping for them for life, it, 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 it really hindered them. And there were a lot of people who were in a similar boat. And so I started to design a kind of program to work with guys like this. And um, the rest is history, as you say. Uh, uh, partly it attracted a lot of media attention in the, in the beginning uh, because I was questioning the value of a, of a deeply enshrined uh, British ideal, you know, sending children away to boarding schools to, to turn out uh, to be sort of entitled, entitled elite. And I was saying, look, my researches are that it's actually psychologically not good for you at all. In fact, it's the opposite. It's, it, it, it's a very, very difficult thing to, uh, uh, to survive and to live with in many, in many ways. So that, that's, a, that's a part of history of how I got into it. Now, one of the reasons, so the main reason I was so immediately drawn uh, to your work, because uh, as you say, you've been at this for a long time in one form or another, was yeah. one of the main concerns I have here looking at the state of the world and the direction of travel, the human race, is, and then looking at the so-called elites with the, their hands on the levers of power making decisions on a global basis, and the, the results being not good, is what makes these people different from the rest of us? Now, I know we're talking about a boarding culture here in Great Britain, particularly in England, but there are obviously other reasons why other world leaders, you know, presidents, left, right and centre, I've got a seemingly a different agenda to the one that you know that we would like them to have, but your boarding hypothesis just made complete sense. And obviously, I'd had concerns about boarding, not having ever done it myself, but met people who had, and I didn't think it was healthy. But uh, there was yeah. a real light bulb moment when I read your book. It was kind of like, yes, I mean, this isn't necessarily going to give us all the answers, but it's a major piece in the puzzle. Yes. Well, you see, see, my, my latest book, Wounded Leaders, is. is is looking at a particular way of being in the world which boarding is an expert training for. Now, so it's not about boarding as such, but it, 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 when I uh, examined all the, 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 the difficulties that the people suffer from who'd been through boarding and all, and all their problems, particularly with uh, intimate relationships, with anything to do with feeling, I began to ask myself, well, you know, what actually is this, what, what is this, what, what is it about, what does it serve this kind of education? Why would we want to send children away from the home? And why did the Brits do it? So my, so my researches immediately took me off in what I call a psychohistorical direction, which is, it's also kind of a new way of looking at the world because psychology, politics, history, have been kept apart as very separate disciplines. You know, all these disciplines which have been specialising ever since the Enlightenment, and actually bringing the bringing them together uh, is something that is really uh, 
giving us a, a, a much more fuller way of looking at the world. So bringing psychology and history together on this subject, what I saw was that in the, the early 19th century, uh, really inspired by the shock, the terrible shock of the French Revolution, something happened in Britain in that which I call the beginnings of the Rational Man Project, which meant that uh, there was a movement away from all kinds of anything that reminded uh, people of vulnerability, of femininity, of uh, um, uh, emotions, of uh, anything which was non-rational, following the Enlightenment and following the, the tremendous shock of the overturning of the status quo that uh, the French Revolution was. And that this Rational Man Project was uh, a way of allowing us also to uh, colonize the world and exploit the colonized world without any conscience. So, for example, you look at the history of uh, the Western world dealing with indigenous people over the 19th century. You'll see that promise after promise was broken. Why was this? Well, I argue that under the Rational Man Project, that indigenous people did not count as humans. They were kind of objects. And because they were what I call, they were unmade, they were non-rational, they were composed of everything that was instinctual, like emotions and sexuality. And uh, the rational man was trying to uh, create himself out and away from this raw matter so that the European rational man became the epitome of God's creation. With, with, it, it, it stood at the top of Darwin's ladder. Now, uh, in this particular uh, movement, there was one problem for, um, for aspiring rational men, particularly in Britain, is that is they were all born as children, and they had to be got away from the, the world of the mother and family and home and softness and emotion and everything that was messy, and so the perfect the perfect vehicle for for uh, achieving this was what later became called the public schools, which was built over a tradition of uh, education for the gentry, and this was made public. In other words, it was made more available to people for anyone who could pay for the fees, and in fact, it was a process of schooling that was industrialized because we've also had an industrial revolution which began to apply to everything. And so that in these schools, you could turn out these rational men who uh, happily had turned away from, from all kind of emotion and vulnerability and softness and would be very good at uh, exploiting the, the, the savages, but even better at ruling the British Empire, administering the British Empire, doing without comfort and home life and all that stuff, and doing it very efficiently, very cost-effectively. So I, put, I saw this whole tradition in this, in this uh, uh, psychohistorical context, and everything started to sort of add up, tick boxes to, to me, and I could understand how perfect it was then and then, of course, how absolutely useless it is uh, today, both at uh, producing uh, husbands, fathers, mothers, uh, as it is for producing uh, world leaders. Now, in the book, you refer to a documentary called The Making of Them, which was a yeah. Br British production which came out back in 1994. Uh, yeah. In fact, you, you borrowed the title for your, your, your first book, on the subject yeah. now I attempted to watch that and I watched a fair bit of it but and this is all about it's kind of an early example of fly on the wall documentary making and it's all about the life of some young boys at their at their boarding school and you know their interaction with their parents and the rest of their family yeah. and their teachers and what have you I because I didn't watch the whole thing I can't necessarily say if this is the tone throughout but I, I hopped around on this program and I found it really harrowing it was really really difficult to watch and it seemed to me that whatever 
however often the kids smiled or said something positive, nobody in that entire film seemed really happy. The kids were unhappy. The parents had a facade of being content, but they didn't look happy to me. The, the teachers... You, you found it was difficult to watch because it, a lot of feelings came up in you. Well, yeah, because I was angry. I was angry yeah, at the, the, what right. these people were doing. Right. And, so, uh, and there was right. a couple of examples of the parents where there was one guy in particular sitting on his sofa uh, going on about, oh, well, you know, we don't have telephone contact with our son. It's better, you know, at eight years old, you can't really have a cogent conversation with them anyway. And then he was laughing about some other poor kid that virtually had to be drugged to the eyeballs to be dragged back to boarding yeah. school. I wanted to break his nose. <laughs> right. You see... And, and it, it's very interesting, Greg, that you say that, because a lot of people find that film difficult to watch because they either, they're either weeping or they get angry or, or a combination of both. And it, it, it's a remarkable documentary, although it's 20 years old now. It, 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 at the time, it, um, it pioneered the use of little video cameras. So they... they, they, they the, 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 they got it got the most intimate shots in, and what you see is on this film, you see a bunch of little boys adjust, adjusting to their first six weeks at prep school, and they're, you know, they range between seven and nine years old, and all those kind of feelings that the viewers have, you can say these are all the sort of feelings that these boys are then learning to dissociate from and that their parents, in consequence, have also dissociated from. And they include feelings about sort of natural injustices, or feelings that a t it's all, all right that a child should want to be in the home at that age, that it should be little and should need help, where it's the, 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 the parents are subbing out their education of their children, the, the bringing up of their children, on a kind of myth that, Children should be self-reliant, grown-up little creatures. And, of course, this is exactly the rational man thesis. You see, they should not be dependent, because dependence is anathema to the rational man project. But it, it becomes so crazy, because it, it's, in, in that film, you can see these are seven, eight, nine-year-olds. They're tiny little tots, and they're naturally dependent and need love and cuddle and touch and things like this, which they then have to do without. But, but what happens is, because people who have been through that, they don't really remember the visceral uh, seven, eight-year-old. They've just cut off from that from, from a long time ago, and, and they assume that that's normal. They, 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 they don't know that it's an outrage. Um, so, so all these kind of things become normalized. And normali normalization, psychoanalytically, is actually one of the strongest defense mechanisms. It means if you normalize something, uh, you, you can take away all your reactions to it. It's very interesting. This is where the, where the usefulness of, of, of bringing... Um, the, the a depth psychology approach uh, uh, together with a historical approach, together with a sociological approach, is that you, you realize that things, the, 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 one of the psyche's tricks, one of the psyche's defense mechanisms is to normalize something. If you, if you normalize uh, your own unhappiness or your, or your ill treatment of another, as I said, such as the, the, the Nazis did with the Jews, if that becomes normalized, then you're defended against the shock and the horror of it. And it, it doesn't register any cognitive dissonance. It don't, you don't register, you, you know, there's no lumps in the porridge. So, and, and so normalization is, is in a very, very successful and powerful defense mechanism. And see what the British have done with the sending away of their, of their young children. They've normalized a kind of social abandonment and uh, focus, focus really uh, only on the, the privilege and the entitlement that comes out of that. So uh, it, 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 the, the, it becomes something which is unquestioned and part of tradition. So that what you saw in that film is the fact that people do not have shocking feelings about what they're seeing 
is part of the defensive normalization about the whole whole business. And now, if you add to that, of course, the, the sort of economic uh, factors that uh, the sort of the boarding school education is um, is a leading part of the of of of, of the, the 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 privatism which which grips British society and worth several billion pounds a year. So there's a, a, there, is, there, there are other economic interests why people don't want to recognize that uh, this might not be the way to bring children up. So it's very, very well established in Britain. You have to get outside the system. You, have, you know, when you're looking, looking, say, from Europe, where they, where they don't normalize uh, sending children away to school on a sort of an elite training from the age of seven or eight, they think it's rather shocking. You know, why do we have children if we want to send them away, since, say, say, most people? Of course, one of the other perceived advantages, and I suppose in a narrow way of looking at it is an advantage, is that uh, a lot of these schools, the path up through public schools and onto Oxford or Cambridge or whatever, is seen by parents and with lots of evidence that this is a path to into the corridors of power or to a top corporate position or basically it's looking at life and that, if you take that narrow materialistic view then this could be a good strategy but but of course the whole point of this is the enormous cost not only to the the parents and children involved but to the rest of us depending on what these these people go on to do with their lives well that, well that that that's the point you see you're absolutely right the, the, i i call it in one of my articles i call it the golden golden path and this golden path does exist you know david cameron was sent away at seven to a, to a, an expensive prep school he then went on, went on to top school eton he went straight into um into um, into oxford and straight out of oxford he's being groomed as a political advisor towards the, doing you know, the top jobs without having had any experience of life whatsoever so the path, the path works, you see. And when I, when I, but you see, when I look at David Cameron, for example, uh, with the eyes that I've developed about this phenomenon, I really see, I'd see the seven-year-old. That's the problem. I see that. I see. I see. Uh, I see how he, he he puts on his his serious face. He's like he puffs himself up. And, and I, I see exactly that phenomena on the film that you're referring to, the making of them. You can see the little boys inventing themselves as serious grown-up pseudo-adults at the age of nine. And they never stop doing it. And uh, I, I don't actually want to... Have, I don't want my country run by people who have got a very defensive attitude to life who are really you know are trying to be grown ups all the time and trying to uh are trying to um uh to fulfill what i call the the, the needs of their, their strategic survival personality to not be caught out not to be seen to be vulnerable uh i don't want those kind of people to be to be running my country because I want people who are secure in themselves, not under a lot of internal stress, who have matured and who have their full range of feelings and empathy in place so that they can not only empathize with the vulnerable in society, but they, they have the, a full range of emotional information which is what we now know through the advances in neuroscience you need to be able to make proper good decisions in the world. Uh, that's the kind of people I want to elect. And this, the Rational Man's Project education designed in the mid-19th century does not turn out people uh, who are best fitted for that. Just for the benefit of overseas listeners who are not aware, we're talking about David Cameron the current UK Prime Minister and the other politicians' names are going to come up here as well, more than likely. And if anyone's interested in who they are and their background, you can you know, stick it in a search engine. But um, what sort of numbers are we currently talking about of people, children entering or leaving this system in any given year? Well, the I mean, this is always a bit in flux, but interesting enough, we've, we've got about the same amount of people in boarding school as we have in prison. So 
you have it, it's a relatively small percentage of people, but in in terms of the representation uh, at national level in in top jobs, it's really quite staggering. You've got 60 percent uh, of uh, the current cabinet uh, who went to major public schools and top university, um, and you know we had a uh, a, a period, let's say, after the war, when Britain was reinventing itself as, as more of a social democracy, where, where it began to change. But ever since, you know, and of course we had Thatcher and Major who weren't from that school themselves, but in some ways wish they were. Uh, and it, it, you know, we've we've really gone back. To, we've we've gone back to a. It's kind of been regressive in British politics. So. We've got increasingly uh, drawing from the traditional class, which in a way the British, the British electorate expects to, to, uh, to, to govern them. But it's not only just in politics that this, the, 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 the uh, representatives of the sort of boarding public school are all over the judiciary, in medicine, in business, the army, the church, you know, all the, the top echelons of society. Now, this would be all very well, it seems to me, if you could show that uh, this kind of schooling turned out people who were all round uh, excellent. And indeed, the schools do have marvelous, marvelous facilities. Of course they do, because of the money involved. But uh, my, my book is actually, uh, my book, Winded Leaders, um, shows from many different angles and particularly the neuroscientific one, how this kind of ed education leaves them uh, very ill-equipped to be persons in today's world, and particularly in leaders, where actually what you need is communal, si communal solutions for, for sort of large-scale problems. You need empathy. You need, you need to be able to relate. You, 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 you know, you know, if you look at David Cameron in Europe, he's, what he can't do in Europe is he he can't make any relationships with anybody. He can't make friends with people. Uh, if you look at the body language when he enters the room uh, with his European colleagues, they're kind of all going, "Who is this guy? You know, what does he want?" And and, and there's this notion of that the, the Britain should be leading Europe, but the, the Europeans say, "Well, hang on a minute. But you need to join something first before you lead it." So there's a kind of very very old-fashioned arrogance that comes out of uh, th this kind of typical leader, and um, I, don't, I really don't think it's good for us, let alone the effect it has on our national life, where uh, you have uh, a state education system which sees itself as the sort of the poor brother of, 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 the, of, of the private system and, uh, and is, is, uh, is misses, you know, a great deal of sort of middle class articulate parents who could be in there on local PTAs trying to make things better and no instead of which they opt out and send their children to private boarding schools. So the the the, the cost of this way of doing things, this anachronistic way of doing things, I mean it's vast, both individually, socially, educationally, and it's really at the heart of the, the, the problems that Britain Britain has and it 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 is also a way of keeping this this sort of hyper-rational uh, ideal going in an age when actually everybody knows worldwide we need to be focused on a different way of doing things. It's interesting you mentioned uh, the numbers of uh, borders being somewhat analogous to the uh, number of prisoners because when I watched the documentary, uh, that the making of them that we were talking about earlier, uh, one of the things that struck me was how much the the routine and the whole environment was like a prison, 24 hours a day almost, you're, apart from you're sleeping, yeah. obviously, you're, you're, everything's planned for you and you have the kids yeah, are out in the right. exercise yard, everything's communal. Interestingly, I mean, I have to be honest and say that I dislike the whole concept of formal schooling, it, not necessarily in theory, but because I think it's sort of people it turns out, and I'm, I'm one of those people, you know, but I just say as it's training, at best it's training kids for a world that kind of doesn't exist anymore. And yeah, at, that's at right. worst, it's, it's turning out compliant consumers who don't ask too many questions. 
Yeah. But um, yeah. it's interesting that other schools will aspire to being like public schools. I went to a grammar school and yeah. we had prefects. We played rugby and cricket. Uh, yeah. we, we learned Latin. We had, um, yeah. we had houses, you know, where there was four different yeah. houses divided up into so we could be competitive. And it was very much... I know, much... it's insane, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. But one year in primary school in the late 70s when I first arrived there, the boys and girls were actually segregated at playtime. Now, that was anachronistic even then. And it was well, as soon as the current headmaster retired, it was actually that year, that was scrapped. But to, yeah. I'd never encountered anything like that before. There was literally a, a, a painted line in the uh, playground and you were not allowed to cross that onto the girl's side or vice versa. Yeah. And that yeah. was extremely unhealthy. Well, the, I, you, you know, I, I know you've, uh, you've been discussing on your, on your program, uh, other, uh, the, uh, other educational theories. And I, I know we, we, we can say that, the, the worldwide, the education of children is, you know, something up for review. Uh, and, but it, you've got in, in Britain, you've got a particular case which which uh, really uh, comes out of this rational man project, as I see, where we which we've been trying to educate a hyper rational games playing kind of Spartan culture, and and be, because it is so elitist, it has an astonishing effect on the whole society in that. Britain is a top-down, what I call top-down society. That means that even, even the, you know, the, the, the ideals of the top percolate down to the bottom, rather than the ideals of a, a social democracy, which come come from the bottom and and uh, inform everybody. So that you have the kind of things that you're talking about that even. You know, when it comes to the numbers of people who go to public schools, it, 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 it's, a, it's a false way of talking about stuff because just as you say, that all the, the other schools are forming themselves in the same mold. They're all trying to be little Etons, uh, like your, the grammar school you talked about. And interesting enough, in, um, there's a marvelous bit in, in Keith Richards, the Rolling Stones autobiography, where he talks about Dartford for tech, you know, being uh, uh, in 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 the in the 50s, he, uh, in the 40s, 40s or 50s, I think it was uh, that he went to uh, that w- was similarly set up. Even though, you know, no one from that school was ever going to go to university. That all the masters had gowns, and it was imagining itself to be like a public school. So there's there's this extraordinarily top down pressure in British society. And that's really quite unique. It's very different. You know, I'm married to a, to a Dane. My, my son is married to a Swedish woman. I spend a lot of my time in France. I've got lots of, lots of friends in Germany. And, you know, and it's completely different over there. In Germany, it's, it's, very, very, uh, it's a very prestigious job to be a teacher. They value teachers. Germany has no elite education, but it has, and nor does Switzerland. But between them, they have more Nobel Prize winners than, than anyone in the world. You know, it's, it's not that you can't be successful even re- rationally. But Britain, we have this very, very odd, top-down, imposed, structured regime uh, where everyone's on a timetable. You know, you mentioned the the comparison to prison. Well. You know, the, the John McCarthy, the hostage in Lebanon in the 70s, and Terry Wake time, he said that he thought he, being a hostage was a double compared to public school. He, you know, he knew actually he, he could do it perfectly well. It was easy to survive. So, and we accept all that as normal. We're not interested in changing it. So we, we're really keeping ourselves back. Uh, in, a, in, in a very, very dangerous way because the, you know, the problems of the world are accelerating and they're, 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 they're getting more acute. They're, they're not, they're, they're, you know, we are we're needing to train and elect leaders who are really on their toes and know how to, you know, know how to deal with the problems of the world and that we're not getting them out of our, our cherished and prized elite privileged education system at the moment. 
Um, I was struck also and brought to mind some of the issues that face um, have faced, in particularly in the past, Catholic schools, but also other faith schools. And there seemed to be some rather dark and familiar patterns came up with, with them. And of course, it's uh, a lot of that's basically the same type of system, only just under a religious banner, as it were. Yeah. Well, of course, you know, the, 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 if you look to history, the, 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 the famous um, Jesuit uh, Ignatius Loyola said, you know, give me a child by the time of seven and he's mine for life. That actually, it, it, it's in it's in that there, those those very vulnerable ages just before puberty that you can really take over a child's will, break a child's will, and 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 socialise him really very deeply from the inside, and 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 I think that's what's happened in Britain. And, and 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 in the colonies, you know, they 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 applied this system very quote successfully end quote in uh, in in the the need to do something with the indigenous populations that were left uh, towards the end of the colonial period in America, in Australia, in Canada. Uh, where they ha- they had overrun the countries, but they still had large indigenous populations, and they wanted to turn them into um, good citizens and workers. So uh, mostly, they they what they would do is they'd take children away from their homes and put them into boarding schools. This time without the, the sort of privilege and the elitism and force feed them Christianity and break their natural. Uh, uh, spiritual beliefs and break their their inner language, which is a language of emotion and sexuality, and substitute it for a kind of guilty puritanism. And the church schools were really, really experts at doing that. And uh, we're, you know, we're we're very fortunate at the moment in that the, the, some of the history of this has just come out. The Canadian government uh, supported a. Uh, a very very expensive long term project looking into the um, to the uh, effect of residential schooling on the on the native population in Canada where there's a huge mixed population in Canada and there have been many many court cases of uh, of, of pupil groups allied with sort of native native first Americans. Uh, movements and and suing the schools for retrospective child abuse and they were very very worried about that so they've looked into this and they've just seen actually how planned this was how discussed it was in the in the parliament and how it was a, a conscious uh decision to give the job to the church of church of canada so that you know you could you you could break a child's spirit from a young age, you can break his language, you can break his indigenous earth-based religion, and you can make him a good Christian, a good worker, and a good citizen by the kind of schooling you give him. Now, there's a fallout, there's a cost. There was a huge amount of fatalities in these schools in Canada. But you could say by the time it's a, the same system is applied, you know, to all over, all over, the, the, you know, Britain and, and, and her colonies, the, 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 the fatality is really, you could say, it's at the level of the soul rather than the body, so that, so that uh, uh, children who've been through this kind of process have in some ways have, had, had, had wounds to their soul or a murder to their soul. And that, I think that's, what's, uh, that, that, that's a sort of image that, that lies behind the, the success of Philip Pullman's work, The Dark Materials, and uh, w- where he has children being, uh, having their, their, their demons captured by, by uh, a very shady kind of church organizations. And, and it's just a way of saying that in, in, in literature. So, so the, you know, the, 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 the cost of this normalized uh, abandonment of children and socialization, industrialized socialization, is very, very great. In tandem with the entitlement illusion, which is part of the title of your book, uh, which, you know, this idea that these elites are somehow born to rule or born to lead, 
Uh, yeah. You can actually see in that famous, notorious photograph of the, the Bullingdon Club whenever George Osborne was part of it. I just look yeah. at that and it just exudes arrogance and uh, yeah. what you would call yeah. that. And, and in tandem with that, we have the aforementioned lack of conscience and lack of empathy. And there's a good, yeah. phrase, a good phrase you have in the book which kind of sums it all up for a lot of, because some of these politicians actually think are not that smart, but some of them clearly are. And you say you, they combine low emotional intelligence with an overdeveloped intellect. And that basically yeah. sums up someone like Michael Gove. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, the, the thing is that the entitlement, it, 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 it's very interesting it, to really think about this entitlement because it's very easy to sort of polarize or to hate, you know, to say how much you hate this and this entitled way of life because what it does to our society and how it how it continues to support the sort of the world of the have haves against the have nots. And yet if you look at it psychologically, one of the things that I see is that the sense of entitlement that these people take on is actually uh, it's actually a compensation for a tremendous inner and emotional poverty. Now, because if you have had to dissociate from your feelings, and when I say dissociate, I mean not just not pay very much attention to your feelings, to your emotions, to your empathy, to your homesickness, to your vulnerability. I mean, dissociation is very, very strong. It means that you actually... uh, it's as if you you send you know you send all your abilities to feel out into the space somewhere like a long way away from you it's the, 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 or you send it into somebody else you put it into somebody else you become very very estranged from the most natural part of yourself you lose your natural emotional language then the the compensation that of entitlement, it kind of uh, is a way that it sort of makes up for it. All right, now I'm going to be socially top dog. And, it, and, and it's not until you see how that balances with it, the inner, inner poverty that you can have any kind of compassion for these people. Otherwise, you just, you know, you, you, you could just feel how... Uh, how, how, how much they're acting out, and you can hate them for that. Now, <laughs> I'm not saying we should let them off the hook. I just I, I don't think we should be electing them. But actually, I think you have to, you do have to look at this in a broad brush, and you can see actually, you know, these people would, you know, they started out as innocent children like anybody else, and and uh, so you you, you, I, you 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 have to look at it right from right from right from the basics but then when you when you see that how how much acting out is done and by acting out i mean that's a specific psychological term which means that someone is acting that a person is acting on a motivation which is unconscious to him you can understand quite a lot of the uh, certainly the bullying tactics that go on in, in politics, and particularly in, 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 in the current government. Well, talking about bullying tactics, you know, obviously that's a major element of life in a boarding school. Um, but we see how this spills over into the, the style of politics that we have. I mean, it's, it's different in different parts of the world, but particularly here in the UK, it's so confrontational. And yeah. that, that transfers across into the media, um, yeah, you know, how exactly. they approach things. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting when Cameron yeah. arrived... He said that there was going to be an end to Yabu politics, and within a yeah. fort within a fortnight they were screaming at each other. And we can also see now, with we got a coalition here in the UK, how dysfunctional that's been. Well, well, it it, it, it has, and and it's it's you know it's very unfortunate in, in that you've got you've it's structurally built into British politics. You've got the House of Commons, which is built. Um, it's exactly like um, public school chapel. It's you know it's the architecture of of mock uh, mock Gothic, mock medieval Victorian, mock medieval Gothic, and and it is built on a deliberately polarised two 
two-system two model. Now, if you look at all, all um, modern parliaments, such as the wonderful Scottish Assembly building, you know, the, you know, they're all, these days, they're all done in the round or in the horseshoe style. And it, it's, uh, you know, which is incidentally, which is, you know, the, the form of, uh, uh, of, of um, conversation uh, that the psychotherapists you use, you know, groups are always done in the round, and, or indigenous people always have conferences in the round so everyone can have their say and feel included and polarization isn't built in. So we've got that structure. And we have various, various kind of uh, ways of of uh, milking it for all it's worth, such as Prime Minister's Question Times, which which is uh, really an ex kind of a ritualised blood sport, in which each side tries out their own bullying tactics. And uh, on it goes, and and you know the opposite benches practice the same kind of bullying to get their own back. But they never really... They, you know, the Tories are the masters of it, because as you say, that everyone, they've all learnt it in their... They've learnt it in public school. And, and that's the way you, you kept... At public school, that's the way you kept the, the heat off you, by, by, by learning to bully before you got bullied. Because what you mustn't be, remember from the Rational Man Project, you mustn't be vulnerable, you mustn't be childish, and you mustn't be wrong. So in, 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 in boarding schools, 24-7 institutions, children together, with very few adults actually taking care of them, and none, no adults actually loving them and holding them, uh, they learn to police themselves very, very effectively. And they bring these skills into the Bullington Club, and they bring them into, into politics. So no one can be, ever be wrong. No one can ever make a mistake. Tony Blair could never have said he was mistaken about Iraq. And, and you know, we might have even, at a time, we might have even forgiven him if he said that. But no, he always says he did what was right, what he thought was right. We have the phenomenon of uh, David Cameron, you know, bullying, lashing out when he has any suspicion that he might be thought to be have uh, done anything slightly misleading, such as in the, 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 the Calm Down Deer incident, which I quote in my book, where he told a tiny fib, but on, on being, being found out, he goes into full bullying mode. He's got the Andrew Mitchell incident, which we'll never know really what, what was at the bottom of that, but, you know, you can ask yourself, well, why was he so angry anyway? You know, why was he? What was it? Was it necessary to be so rude? Whatever it was, whatever it was, he said. And a lot of this you can you can trace back to the, I think the the rather insecure little boy inside the man, trying to bully before he gets hurt or found out that he's wrong. And you know, it adds up. What I call in the book is 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 that it's the boys and the men who run things in Britain. Earlier you mentioned two former British Prime Ministers, Margaret Thatcher, obviously very famous, John Major, less so, and they didn't come through this public school system, but they would probably have liked to, as you say, but they got where they got anyway, and they imitated, yeah. they imitated a lot of the actions and behaviours of people who have. And it's interesting when you look at the UK Parliament and you see MPs that are actually quite different, that have not come through this system. Yeah. And like people, people like Dennis Skinner, George Galloway, yeah. T- Tony Benn, you mentioned Michael Foote, even someone like yeah. Robin Cook. And these, these basically are the ad- indigenous people of the parliament in the way that they, yeah. they, they're, they're human beings. Yes, yes. And I would say also the, 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 the person I miss very much at the moment in British politics, Alan Johnson, um, uh, who... Um, these were the, the, mostly what, what you what you notice about people like that is uh, is their authenticity, and uh, the you see the what I call the boarding school survivor. He he he, he, had, 
the person who's been through a boarding public school, he can't afford to be authentic. He's always putting on a front. So um, I think it's one of the reasons, say, Gordon Brown looked, looked so awkward and embarrassed when he was next to Tony Blair, because he, he just couldn't do it. He couldn't do that big personality charisma thing. And in, in a way, we've got so used to that style that um, that we are that we we think there's something lacking if we see someone being sort of an ordinary, genuine person being themselves. And you know, interesting enough, I, I certainly thought myself that the that the phenomenon of the coalition this time, apart from having to do with the the, the widespread and increasing voter apathy and uh, uh, and the increasing number of people who don't vote, um, but, but the success of the coalition was was a lot of it was due to Nick Clegg's you know Nick Clegg's ele- election night speeches where he 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 did in a way the sort of Nigel Farage trick of saying you know I'm an ordinary authentic guy and. Uh, you know the public lapped it up. You know where there, there is a hunger. There's a hunger for that beyond. You know at the same time as there's a kind of a mistrust of it as well. So one of the things we have to do as an electorate, we have to kind of retrain ourselves. It seems to me it's no good just waiting for the right politicians to 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 turn up. We have to really we have to train our way of seeing these people, train our way of thinking. And train ourselves back into uh, knowing that our electoral choice is incredibly important, and, um, and and using it constructively to get actually the kind of politics we want. Now I've often wondered about the sort of lust for power that you see in certain types of people, because I, I never understood it. Because you know, personally, I don't want control over anybody else really, other than myself. And I, I then began to wonder, in the light of, of your book that maybe some of these elites and the politicians are looking for control over other people. It's part of this uh, rigid control that they've had to have of, of themselves in the past, and that also there's a certain yeah. lack, lack of control somewhere within them that they're afraid of, you know, afraid to show. So therefore, it's a, a kind of a control freak attitude. And that this would, could possibly, again, go back to this idea that, um, you know, they seem unable to be idle and to look inward and to reflect on yeah, things. Yeah, uh, they, yeah. they fill their time with, with work and activity. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. And the that uh, the what you could what we and another way of looking at this is to say that the the Rational Man Project, which is something which has come to take over the whole of the Western world, that in that it itself. It, 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 in the end, it begins to value qualities which um, uh, psychologists call sociopathic qualities. That means uh, a sociopath is someone who, who doesn't have a lot of feelings and doesn't have any empathy. And um, although the sort of the the, the the profile of the so the, the the etiological profile how 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 you know what makes soci- sociopaths in other words isn't isn't there isn't much there isn't a lot of agreement on but there's, there's a very interesting book called the sociopath next door that came out about five years ago which reckons that certainly in American society you're talking about four or five percent of people uh, could be classified as sociopaths and of that that percentage, 80, 90 percent of them are in leadership roles, in and leadership roles, uh, not just in, not just in corporations. There's obviously, you know, to, to succeed in a corporation these days, you've got to be able to, you know, work 80 hours a week and 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 say how much your family is important to you on your website, but 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 hardly ever have any time for them, stuff like that. But also leadership roles in positions of education in 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 therapy uh in in uh, you know in in the church and things like that so um you've got this general trend of 
sociopaths being rewarded and being quite successful in the kind of leadership roles that we're accustomed to in the whole of the Western world. And then you've got a very specific British case where you've got these children who've been trained to be doers, to be what to do what we call timetabling. We call you know no free time in their lives, always activity, to be doing to, to be to be abhor anything to do with being and so that the the the, the, the this this training combining with the sort of general world trend trend in these things uh it it, it means that that, that 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 people who are sort of only 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 partially living their their lives uh are then uh, characterologically on a sort of fast track to positions of power. And you get certain individuals who, for example, we talked about John Major just now, John Major who hadn't gone to public school and yet was always seen as a rather grey man. He turned out in retrospect, in comparison to the kind of leadership we've had since him, to have been much better at the arts of of being and the arts of relating, the arts of uh, making friends, which is necessary in 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 a global political context, than than one might have imagined. Uh, but if you've if you've been through the hyper rational training of a boarding school, you learn to distrust foreigners. You learn to uh, to value independence and leading groups rather than belonging to them. So we've had singularly poor leadership, I think, over the last few years. And and uh, we seem to be, it, it, we, we, we don't seem to be able to know where to go from this. And, the, and the, the, the sort of current trends are all very negative. The whole notion of backing out of Europe and, and, and the sort of... Uh, UKIP parties are all a popularity. It's all a reflection of this fact that that our leaders have turned away from projecting out the kind of qualities that actually in our hearts we know we want people to ha- to have to embody that that the sort of societies that we we were we were on the verge of creating after the Second World War that we know in our hearts we really want, but we just can't make that next step uh, with, with, with the current batch of leaders, it seems to me. Well, you spoke earlier about with certain of these individuals and an inability to, to make friends, you know, and to really be genuine um, and, you know, and open and be themselves because perhaps many of them don't know who they are in one sense. You know, they've not been encouraged to uh, get in touch with themselves in that way. But there's a section in the book which I think is very significant just to look at the personal lives of some of these people. And you talk about how their upbringing and schooling has affected their personal relationships, not just friends, but, you know, intimate relationships, yeah. wives, girlfriends, you know, husbands yeah. as well. And also the yeah, whole yeah. world of, um, you know, of intim- intimacy when it comes to sex. And this is, there were interviewees in the aforementioned documentary who talked very openly about this. And they, um, they were clearly, you know, in distress about what this um, schooling had done to their personal lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you you cannot you cannot get away without effects if you've if you've been institutionalised as a child. Uh, you uh, if you've been institutionalised in a in a one gender environment, for example, and when you're going through puberty, it makes the, the experience of puberty, which for all of us is very bewildering, even even more strange. One of the things that it does to to boys in in, in public boarding schools is that it, it it sort of excites the idea that uh, when they get out that woman is going to be absolutely the saviour to them and that, that, that women are going to be these fantastic sex goddesses who are just going to want to serve them and, 
and, and everything's, you know, once they're out into the world of sex and women, they will be home and dry and in paradise again. But of course, it's it's a childish fancy because women happen to be people. It's a and 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 they, you know, and and the 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 business of of relating to and getting on intimately with another person, especially another person of the gender, is one of the most uh, challenging things that any human being has to do in their lives anyway. So, uh, so the, it, so the, so ex borders, ex borders come out knowing nothing about uh, intimacy, nothing about relationship, with fantasies about the alternate, the other sex, and they will inevitably be let down. Plus, they come out of an atmosphere where there, there's, uh, in the sort of 24-7 hot housing of these schools, keeping themselves to themselves and not getting abused or, or uh, having any kind of privacy was incredibly difficult. So that they, 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 they very often become very, rather secretive beings. And secretive, being secretive is, is, is absolutely opposite from the sort of qual qualities you need in a relationship. And to make a relationship work, you need to be willing to be what I would call being voluntarily vulnerable. And that is actually a red rag to someone who's been through a boarding school. So uh, it, they're going to find it difficult, and, and, and it, it's inevitable. And so people who actually do realize they've had a therapy, you know, have a, that, that boarding has been a problem for them and turn up in therapy, which are, you know, they're increasingly greater numbers, but it has been very few in the past out of the fear of that kind of introspection, are people very often who have found that something's gone wrong in their marriage or, they, or they're finding, they're finding their, their intimate relationship with the opposite sex different, or they just become a parent, or the child has become seven or eight, and they start to realize, crikey, what happened to me? And uh, then want to come and get some help with that. And they realize that actually they haven't had, they haven't had a good training for uh, intimate life. Um, another sort of darker element to this, the sexual question is that sexual abuse, however limited it might be, you know, has occurred in public schools that would not otherwise yeah. have not otherwise have occurred, occurred in regular state schooling for obvious reasons. And this for again clearly kind of devastating effect on someone's life. And I have pondered often that the potential connections between incidents like that and what we see, we're seeing. I've seen a lot of it recently in terms of um, elites and questions of paedophilia. I mean, yeah. I'm not, I'm not from the no smoke without fire camp, but there's a, been an inordinately large number, way out of proportion from what you would expect, of these sorts of accusations and things flying around. And the fact that there's official investigations into this means it's been taken seriously. Well, yes, you're right, Greg. And you see, you, the, uh, the one of the things that that. Uh, the public is be beginning to become aware of, you know, following the Savile scandal and all that, is the connection of institutions and child abuse. Uh, and uh, boarding public schools, the, you know, these are institutions, just like the BBC is an institution, just like care homes are institutions. And in, in what you have in institutions is you have children who are being looked after, you know, by staff and not parents of, you know, at, at, at whatever, you know, at a ratio of, I don't know, 10 to 1 or something like this, or, you mean, obviously that sort of thing varies, but you have a lot of children to look after, and anyone who's brought up a child, who's had any parent knows that actually looking after one or two children with with one or two parents is an enormous task. It's an enormous task because you, 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 not only have you got to care for them, but every, every all your input has a uh, an effect on them. It has a you know they they learning about the world from how you relate to them and how you treat them. 
Now, an institution like a like a boarding school where uh, the children are on their own 24 hours a day, seven days a week, three month terms with occasional visits, or in the more enlightened places with sort of weekend visits home, the 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 protection and the care that you're able to give from a staff perspective, and you know, it covered under the word in loco parentis, in the place of the parent, is only minimal. They try to make sure that they don't hurt themselves in accidents and things like that. But the, but the ability to protect a child from uh, the sort of very, very manipulative scheming of someone who's got pedophilic feelings and in his position of power in a school is minimal. It's very, very, very subtle. And you can put all the inspections you like in, but it's still going to go on. So it's it's built into the system that you're going to get that kind of um, abuse coming in. Plus the fact you get kids herded together through puberty in single-sex groups very confused very often about their longings, about their, their how they can express any of their sexuality, and you know when they, if they become if they have sexual experimentation with with their peer group, whether that means that they're homosexual or whether it's normal or they're perverted, and 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 all the time being raised by people who are experts, the teachers in, their, in, in, in rationality and uh, who, who themselves have very little uh, to offer in terms of sexual emotional education, who may have recourse to traditional religious teachings when it comes to anything that they think is approaching morality, you could say the children are very, very unguided, very, very unlooked for and unlooked after. So this is going to have effect on them, and uh, it's not that surprising that if, as adults, uh, we find that people who've been in, in these kind of groups uh, themselves act out. Um, what we know from, from, from studies of uh, 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 child abuse, because although the public's only just become aware of it in Britain, we've had a hundred years of working with child abuse and psychotherapy. We know that a considerable, uh, an alarmingly high proportion of people who uh, turn out to be abusers or pedophiles were themselves abused in childhood. So it's a circular, very, very difficult argument. And, and you know, the only way that you can... You can counter this in, 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 in boarding schools is to say, look, children should be in their be in their homes at least until they're you know, 15 or 16 when they really might be ready for a bit of boarding in a sixth form college. For stuff. But please, let's keep little children at home. That's the best thing. Uh, Nick, as we begin to uh, wind things up for today, um, I think that looking to the future, that the, the sort of emotionally damaged leadership uh, is potentially, ultimately, highly dangerous. As we've alluded to earlier, we're facing global crises on many fronts. And of course, yeah. it's not just British politicians, other world leaders, some of them do tend to exhibit similar behaviours. It may be because they may not have gone to boarding school, but maybe they suffered from a... I certainly would look at the Bush family and wonder about how much emotional engagement there really was there with, with the children yeah. of various yeah. generations. But the bottom line is that we need new types of leadership. And given that this that cyclic situation we've talked about, you know, that a lot of parents who boarded then send their kids and on and on it goes and we can look at the British establishment and see it as something absolutely monolithic and unchangeable yeah. but we, but something has to give you know whether voluntarily or through some sort of crisis yes you're absolutely right you see and and I think let's put things into perspective that you know the major problem in the world is not the British boarding school system the the, the problem that we're looking at in terms of our uh, awful leadership and, and, and very, very, you know, very rare examples of good leaders who, according to the uh, the academic historian Archie Brown, he says that you, he says is very clearly looking back in the last hundred years of history, you say the really good leaders are not strong dominant leaders; they're the ones who practice 
collective leadership decisions, who listen to their to their cabinets, who listen to their electorate, and who, who try to transform their societies for the better. So there, you know, been a few of those, but there've been a, a, a tremendous lack, given the, the actual power that we have as human beings. And what we're talking about is a problem which comes out of hyper-rationality in general. And the, the British case is just a kind of a hot housing fast stream into this hyper-rational training. And it's interesting to us because whereas it's so diffuse in the rest of the world, in Britain you can see it, it's like a really good case study because it's only Britain and the colonies that practice this. So you can see the effects of hot housing, of pumping people up into through hyper rational training, and and you can see that the, 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 the what the the uh, the missing pieces might be, just as if you wanted to look at the effects of single child families, you would look you would look at China because that's the, that's the group where they've practiced that over a, a long enough period to be able to examine the effects. So we can see in Britain the effect on the middle and upper classes through the, the long-term practice of sending children away to school. So it's really just a case study of, of this whole business of uh, how, how we are raising and electing and valuing um, partial people when actually the emotionally intelligent human being who is able uh, to practice empathy, who is in, who is, who, who, who is, who is what we, psychotherapists, what we call grounded, who is not trying to project out an image of himself, which was, say, so apparent in, in, in George Bush, as you, you know, that you mentioned, uh, who is able to be informed by his heart as well as his head, uh, who is able to, um, to have both hemispheres of his brain working, because what the current studies in neuroscience show that if you, if you brought, bring someone up on uh, a, a, a strict diet of rationality, you end up only, only working the left hemisphere of the brain, not the right hemisphere, which, which is much more busy with wide context, with big picture analysis, with relational skills. So we've got all these pieces in the puzzle now, and we just what we what I wanted to do with wounded leaders is to say, look, here's a real case study, um, looking at uh, a phenomenon from several perspectives, from from psychotherapy, from politics, from history, from neuroscience. And we really have got a case to see what's wrong with leadership. Uh, and, uh, it, 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 you know, let's turn away from that now. That's, that's what I'm hoping to say in this book. And one of the ways we can start doing that is by reforming our education system. Well, Nick, today we've been talking about, as you just mentioned, your new book, Wounded Leaders, uh, British Elitism and the Entitlement Illusion. That's easily available online. but. Uh, Perhaps you'd like to share with listeners in closing your website and well anything else you'd like to put out there. Yeah, well if you if you like to see some talks and, and, and blogs and, and, and audios about the book and a couple of videos as well, uh, you can go to woundedleaders.co.uk and there's some links to order it there. You can you can order it through Amazon uh, Amazon.uk as yet Australia and America Amazon are not carrying it. And um, there's also there's links on the website to articles that appeared about it in the, in the Guardian and in Therapy Today. Um, and there's also a site for boarding school survivors. If you recognize you've been affected by some of these issues yourself, boarding school survivors, uh, www.boardingschoolsurvivors.co.uk is where we, we, we have a site which puts out uh, what we can offer in terms of therapeutic help for uh, for adults, ex-adults. This is not it's not about children. This is for ex-adults, and uh, we hold regular uh, workshops and put people in touch with informed therapists. And 
the making of them book is also available from there, which is my first book, going looking specifically at the, 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 the boarding school survival itself. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you, Nick, for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Great. Thanks very much, Greg. It's been a pleasure. Well, folks, that's it for another week. As ever, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy the show, please check out the website. That's LegalizeFreedom.com, Legalize-Freedom.com, where you'll find an archive of programs offering alternative views on a wide range of topics, including world affairs, politics and economics, science and technology, religion and spirituality, conspiracy and alternative history. You can also browse and buy a range of books and DVDs from our guests, and if you're feeling generous, make a donation to help keep the site up and running. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to LegalizeFreedom.com.